The connective tissue is the most amazingly versatile tissue. If you went to HQ and uh, bought all the things that you'd need to uh, make a body, the connective tissue makes all those things by uh, having a variety of fibers and a variety of um, substances that surround the fibers to make all these different tissues like bone uh, that has collagen, connective tissue running through it, and then the calcium around it, and cartilage that goes on joints, and all the fat, and the fascia that goes around the muscles. It's um, really good to look at this in animal tissue because if you look at the animal, uh, fresh animal tissue, you can see how it slides on each other and how it works much more easily than you can in tissue that has been preserved with formaldehyde, which is true of cadavers. It's great to look at cadavers, but you can learn a lot by looking at the animal connective tissue. So, uh, for instance, these are tendons here, which you can see are pulling on the muscles, and as we move it back and forth, perhaps you can see here that this is sliding. And if you put your fingers on it, you guys, you can feel the quality of the tissue and how that tissue slides. So that everything that you're looking at here, except for the muscle, the red muscle tissue itself, is connective tissue, and you can even see in under here how you can get between one layer and the other because the whole thing is layered. And the fascia that's in the muscle there will go into the tendon, the tendon will go into the bone, and so forth. And if we got down into the joint here, uh, you can't see it, but I can feel it, and you guys can feel it, the kind of synovial fluid of that's a bit like egg white that provides the lubricant. That too is a form of connective tissue. So it's uh, good to look at the animal tissue um, because it's fresher and more close to what fascia is really like in the body. But now let's go look at some slides of uh, fascia as it appears in the human body. Don't forget to wash your hands before we get back to the class. Okay, so now let's look at some slides of fascia as it occurs in a human being with uh, the advantage that we're really looking at slides from a human being and the disadvantage that we're looking at fascia that has been treated with formaldehyde, with formalin, so that it doesn't look as natural. Uh, however, I think it'll help us out anyway, especially this picture by my friend and rolfer Ron Thompson, who uh, teased up some muscle fibers so that you can see the endomesium, the fascia, the collagen, the connective tissue, I'm using all those words interchangeably, uh, that runs in between the muscle fibers. Muscle is like hamburger. It can't pull on anything without this fascial net, which is like cotton candy, a fish net, um, this tensile structure that holds each muscle cell in place and this is the stuff that's going to form into a tendon when the muscle runs out and run down towards the bone and this is the stuff that will form the periosteum but you're just seeing part of this continual net as it exists within the muscle here. And here you can see overlapping layers of fascia and I uh, include this slide because you can see along here the lines where there's extra tension so that the fascia has formed in thicker ways, whereas you can see it going through here, um, somewhat like strapping tape that you use at the post office, and you can see some of the overlapping lines going in the opposite direction. Here we have a client, um, well, I guess this client is standing up, so that you can see the back muscles here, and over here you can see the abdominal fasciae coming around and joining up to the transverse processes in the back. Um, I wanted you to see how the various layers of fascia um, can interlink with each other so that you actually get uh, an interwoven link so that when somebody says, well, you should go crosswise across the fibers because it should be cross-fiber fiction, well, that still doesn't tell you what direction to move because there are all kinds of directions within the fascial net. And this one shows us, can you tell where we are? <laughs> A little hard, isn't it? That's the iliotibial band that goes down the outside of the leg. So that somebody's cut into the fascia. What you're seeing here is the fat that's on the surface of the body that's usually taken off in dissection, but here it was left on. And uh, the iliotibial band was cut and resected 
with the hemostat, but what I'd like you to see is one, how strong this baby is coming down through there, and two, that there are fibers going vertically along the iliotibial band, but at the same time there are many fibers going horizontally, which would be going around the thigh, the fascia lata that goes around the thigh. This slide shows us the sternum, the breastbone, and you can see just right out at the edges of the slide, you can see the beginning of the pectoral muscles. And what you see going here are the fibers that go across from one side to the other. And I ask you to notice that these fibers here are stronger on this leg of this X than these fibers here on this leg of the X. The suggestion would be here that this person was left-handed or used their left hand more strongly than their right so that they create extra strain coming down along here and the fascial system of the body responds by laying down extra fiber along that line. That's the same kind of thing that happens posturally. If you have a twist in your body, that's going to put strains through your body in different areas and your body will lay down fascia, lay down collagen to resist those strains. Here, can you tell where this is? This is difficult. This is inside the head. What you're looking at here is the falx cerebri, the piece of fascia that sep um, separates the two hemispheres of your brain. And you can see that most of it here is arranged like a fan. And the fan's going around here, which is going around the, the bottom edge of that piece of fascia. The skull is up here. But look back here, look at that extra fascia coming along here, there is a line of strain through this person's fox where the, uh, the person, the person's system has laid down this extra fascia to meet that strain. Now, this is no little piece of saran wrap that goes between the two parts of your brain. It suggests that there's really a lot of strain on that fascia, which coincides with the kind of thing that uh, we've been learning from investigating the craniosacral therapy and the craniosacral pulse. Now this slide is really quite important to the anatomy trains. What you're looking at here is the junction between two muscles. And uh, in this case, they're interdigitating on the ribs and the next muscle is taking off from there. And what I want you to notice here is that some of the fascia is coming down and stopping on the ribs and some of it passes right through and joins the next fascia um, of the next muscle. So when we're talking about the myofasciae, the myo part might stop, but the fasciae doesn't. So we'd call this a station on the anatomy train, and here's the track running right through. You can also see how the blood vessels and the nerves, although you can't see the nerves on this slide, the blood vessels and nerves use the fascia as a kind of track, as a scaffolding, and they hang on to the fascia as they distribute themselves throughout the tissue. So this, if you keep the concept of how the fascia is continuous, then the idea of these myofascial continuities becomes easier to swallow. Of course, they aren't really ribbons, these myofascial meridians. I'm going to lay them out as ribbons because they're easy to see, and the ribbons that I'm going to lay out are uh, very common lines of pull that you see in the body. But um, it's really layers, like the ecto, endo, and mesodermal layers, these are mesodermal layers of fascia from the origami of, of uh, the embryology. And here in this slide you can see some of those layers done up in blue separating say the kidneys from the psoas and here's a line separating the psoas from the quadratus lumborum. This is a, a slice through the lower backs, but the, uh, the blue lines here show you some of the fascial planes um, and how they divide themselves into layers. And uh, this one, this actually is a human thigh. It has been uh, modified here by putting glycerin over it. That's why it looks so lifelike, but don't worry. We didn't take it off anybody uh, who was alive, even though it looks that way. What I'd like you to see here is how the fascia is layered through the body. This is the stuff that we work with. Um, the first layer, which you can only see as a little white line here, is the dermis. And that's the layer that comes with your skin. It's just like. Uh, carpet backing. So the, every time you pick up your skin, you pick up that dermal layer with you. 
And the reason you can pick up your skin is because of this next subcutaneous layer, which is the layer that's full of fat and white blood cells and uh, infection fighting cells in general. So that layer has a very loose fibrous network to it. So um, it's for that reason that you can pick up your skin. And if you come to some place and you try to pick up your skin and it's not so easy, that's because that subcutaneous layer is more tightly woven or hammered down onto the one beneath it. Um, this layer is, on average, don't crucify me, thicker in women than in men. So um, that's why, in general, women are softer than men, is because this layer is thicker. Um, this layer here is the first layer that we really think about as structural body workers, and it's the superficial fascia. It is, if you like, the body leotard or a plastic bag that goes right up over the whole body and gets tied at the top. This is the layer that really keeps us in the shape that we're in and determines our postural set. Inside that layer is the next layer, quite thin here, is the so-called epimesium, the outer layer of the muscle fascia, what people keep thinking about when they say myofascia, but all of these layers are, are fascia. So then there would be fascia through the muscle, as we saw in the first slide of this series, the, uh, all that individual cotton candy in between the uh, muscle fibers. And then you can see a layer of fascia right here, this white line. This is an intermuscular septum. Now, if I stuck my fingers down into that intermuscular septum here, half that white line would go with this muscle, and half the white line would go with this muscle. So uh, it's been classical anatomists have just considered it as being this outer fascial layer going with the muscles. But structural body workers consider it to be a layer of, of its own. You can think of a grapefruit. If I took the grapefruit and I cut it through its equator as if I was going to have it for breakfast, I would see all these walls between the sections of the grapefruit. But if I peeled the grapefruit and then divided the sections, you'd see that half of that wall would go with one section of the grapefruit and half of that wall would go with the other section of the grapefruit. So is it one wall or it's two walls? It's both. So in considering it, like the wall of the grapefruit when I cut it through the equator, this structure here, this intermuscular septum, is a fascial structure that we can consider in terms of its length, its ability to move relative to itself, relative to the things that are around it, and we do. The next layer down of fascia is just peeled back a little bit here, and that's the periosteum. That's the kind of saran wrap coating that goes around each of the bones, and it's the layer in which the muscles actually attach. Very rarely, sometimes, uh, the hamstrings a little bit, the psoas definitely, some of the other muscles actually attach into the fabric of the bone itself. But most of the muscles attach to the periosteum. So that's the next layer of fascia. And the final layer of fascia, I guess I should say connective tissue, because it's not really fascia, but it is a connective tissue, is bone. The bone is filled with collagen, just the same as the rest of the connective tissue. It's just that bone has a much harder ground substance or this, this calcium appetite that we see around it. So look, we've got seven layers of fascia. One, the dermis. Two, the subcutaneous layer, the areolar layer or the fat layer. Uh, three, the superficial fascia. Four, the myofascia around the outside of the muscles. Five intermuscular septa, six, the periosteum, and seven, the bone. Now, it's not always seven layers. It's uh, in some places you have lots more layers and in some places a few less, but that generally gives you a kind of summary of how the fascial layers uh, are laid out in the body. And this amazing image, which shows about the same part of the body, but with the muscle tissue removed so that you can see these intermuscular septa and the whole fascial net between the femur and the skin, uh, this was created by my colleague Jeff Lynn using data from the Visual Human Data Project. And when this is complete, we will have a picture of the fascial man that we were talking about earlier. <laughs>